Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, today we're going to um, go for the next uh, topic, which is lecture 10 uh, on safety, security and privacy of IIoT. As we know, when we are using the IIoT technologies, it will involve several stakeholders, which are the vendors, service provider, regulator, and also the customers. Okay, so when uh, there are a lot of people involved in this, uh, what we call system, um, security requirement is very important because we want to protect our data, we want to protect our, uh, what we call the uh, informations and all of our, um, what we call system uh, inside there. Okay, so due to this, we have to set the requirement. For example, uh, in this security, uh, there are eight um, components that you have to see, which are confidentiality, integrity, authentication, access control, non-repudiation, dependability, safety, and also privacy. We're going to look on these elements one by one later. When we talk about confidentiality of the what we call the system in IoT, um, it is the property which provide the protection of the data, meaning that we want our data to be confidential. We don't want everyone to uh, access to have access to our data. Okay, so this confidentiality um, uh, properties is important or requirement is very important. Uh, in order for us to protect our data, uh, in order to uh, store or transmit our data, and uh, we w we don't want it to be disclosed to the other party. Okay. Second one is integrity. Uh, this integrity will enable the confirmation, which is uh, it verify uh, the correctness of the related data uh, that ha we have in the system. We don't want our data to be what we call. Uh, uh, not correct so that it will affect the operation uh, in in the system and then we want also um, our system to have authentication uh, okay so for this authentication it uh, uh, enabled the identification of any party uh, that involved uh, in the transaction, uh, whether producing, processing, transmitting, or receiving data. So, meaning we have to authenticate the identity of people who can access to our uh, data. Okay. And then uh, the system also supposed to have access control where, where it ensures service provision to authorized user, meaning that only people that is uh, authorized to, to access to that data is supposed to be able to access to that data. For example, like we are using the account, the bank account. Only us uh, have the uh, um what we call the uh, username and also the password. So meaning that we have that control. We uh, the access control is only people that are supposed to have the access to that system only can access to the data. Okay, the next is non-repudiation. So, what is what does it mean by non-repudiation? So, uh, there is a, a ability to disable any participant uh, to, to that transaction uh, to deny action or their participation. Meaning that, uh, for example, you detect that there is someone that is not supposed to be uh, to, to, to assess your data uh, in the system, but, uh, but they... Uh, able to go into that uh, system so you're supposed to, the your system supposed to have this uh, requirement which is non-repudiation where you can terminate the transaction or any action that taken by uh, non uh, people that have no access to that uh, uh, system okay so the next one is dependability uh, dependability require provision of system and service functionality with specific properties uh, such as continuous service, even in the presence of error and failure, meeting specific real-time requirements. So when we are operating a, a, a what we call an operation, uh, we want our system to be dependable. Uh, it can be depend. Uh, okay. So meaning that we don't want our service to have uh, what we call if let's say there is a error or failure, the operation not supposed to be. Uh, stop is supposed to be having um, 
what we call a, a, a method where we still can um, uh, operate our system. Okay. So the next one is safety. Uh, it's a service and pro, uh, process requirement that warrants service provisioning so that there is no hazard to user. Of course, if let's say the, the, the system that we're using is uh, giving ha ha hazard to the user, it's not uh, going to be a good system, right? We, we want it to be safe to every, for everyone to use it. Okay, the next one is privacy, which it protect the personal information from access by unauthorized actors. Okay, so uh, like, like us, uh, when we're using the bank account or when we are uh, filling the forms and everything, we want our privacy to be protected, right? So, of course, in the uh, system of the IoT also, privacy is very important, especially when we are involving with uh, sensitive things or uh, if, let's say, uh, the vendors don't want it to be, their, their uh, information to be distributed to the other person and everything. So, this is supposed to be uh, in the requirement for the uh, IoT system. Since we know that uh, in IIoT is a very complex system, okay, so due to that, security of the IOT will cover several parts of the whole system. Uh, some part might use a certain uh, type of security, and some others will be using the other uh, type of security. Okay, so among the type of security that we're going, going to look into uh, today will be uh, system security, network security, general application security, application process security and safety, reliable and secure design IoT application, runtime monitoring and RMAT approach. Of course, by the time uh, we finish this one, uh, of course, there, out there, there are a lot more security of IoT. But these are some basic um, systems that we have to look into. Now, let us look into the first one, which is system security. Uh, what is system security? Uh, system security is uh, it described by the control and safeguard that an organization takes to ensure uh, the network and also the resources are safe from downtime, interference, and or malicious intrusion. So this is the what we call the basic uh, security that's supposed to have to to be uh, applied in uh, one organization or one system, because if we don't have any system security, um, there is a possibility that people uh, will be able to interfere or to intrusion into our system. Okay, so that's why system security is very important. So if data security is meant to protect the information in the books in the library, then system security is what uh, protect the library itself, okay? So uh, when we have the data, we only uh, secure the data, okay? So meaning it's become data security. Uh, when we have a system, then uh, when we want to protect that system, it's become system security. In IoT system, there are a lot of embedded computing system that employ architectures analogs to general purpose one. Okay, so uh, this is like a one system where all of the computing uh, system is being integrated together. So a typical structure for the IoT system uh, is shown in the figure. Uh, if you can see in here, uh, we do have the processing, which is the processor. And then we have the memory, and then we have the input output, and also the uh, power sources. Okay, for example, the battery uh, or any other power sources. As we see in the previous um, figure, so uh, when we want to secure the system, we require to protect uh, the the system as a whole, not. Uh, not only the protection of all the components individually. Okay, so the specific requirement are placed depending on the operational environment and the expected capability of the attacker. Okay, so so depend on the nature of the what we call the industry or the system that we uh, we want to develop for our um, what we call factory or our uh, IoT uh, environment. So uh, the requirement is uh, based on that condition okay based on that operation uh, environment okay so the security of standalone system is achieved with several level of protection that includes physical and hardware security 
as well as trusted computing platform. Okay. So, uh, when we have a system, of course, we have hardware, right? <clears throat> Complex hardware system, for example, the processor, microcontroller, uh, is is possible for people to attack it, right? So, uh, due to this, defense against such attack require dedicated hardware, specialized design techniques, or even new architectural concept. So, if you can recall again the video about the cloud. Uh, the Google Cloud um, facilities. Okay, so if you can see, they have seven layers of security in order to protect the hardware, right? So not even people um, that are not authorized uh, is allowed into the building or into the into that uh, premise. Okay, so in order to protect the hardware, so the the same for our system. Uh, if let's say you have one IoT system, of course you want to protect your hardware. For example, if you put the sensors and everything inside the field or in inside the what we call inside the factory, of course you want to protect it from any damage or any vandalism from other people. Uh, so of course you will have to uh, protect it through uh, dedicated hardware. For example, you have to design a cover or anything in order to uh, protect it from being damaged. From that, you also will have to uh, protect the software that you use in 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 your IoT system. Uh, for example, anti tampering techniques that uh, enable different de level of physical protection. Uh, for example, from tampering evidence to temper response, temper resistance, and are employed according depending on the security requirement of the system, and it operational environment so of course uh, not only the hardware you also have to protect all the software that you use in, in your system <clears throat> like like i mentioned uh, uh, like tampering technique that that mentioned here okay so we don't want anybody to tamper to our uh, software we don't want anybody to touch uh, all the system that we already set up to make sure that our uh, a system work properly, right? Okay, so anti temper technology have been developed to protect system after their deployment. So they need to address physical and hardware attack of attackers with variable capability in a wide range of hostile environment, especially for critical applications such as surveillance. Okay, so uh, that's how the system security uh, done uh, for the software. Now, when we're using the IoT system, so of course we will need a network, crack. Right? So due to that, we will require the network security. If not, uh, then your system can be easily uh, interrupted uh, by uh, what we call from uh, outer, uh, what we call outer attack or something. Uh, and then uh, secure communication will require encryption and authorization mechanism as well as a secure routing method in a network. So network system, especially through the internet, need to ensure that data are being communicated only among authorized user and process and that this exchange data are legal, okay? So this is usually achieved through the use of firewall, okay? So the same like how we use our uh, computer, uh, we do have firewalls, we do have the, what we call, uh, we use a lot of um, uh, software to protect our uh, our network uh, from being um, from from any ransom from or from any um, uh, what we call uh, viruses from uh, outside, right? So the same like in our IoT system, we will require to protect this network security in order to make sure that nobody uh, will interrupt with our network. In IoT system, there are two types of um, what we call attack that is very significant, which is denial of service, DOS, and distributed denial of service, DDOS. In DOS, it exploits vulnerabilities, uh, hardware or software by sending careful constructed packet to the target system, where the typical goal of this DOS is to crash the target system. Uh, usually, it happens... Uh, when it exploit uh, the system which is not patched what does it mean um uh, unpatched or uh, system is uh, it refer to the application or system that contain known vulnerabilities that have not yet been addressed through the implementation of updates or patch 
uh, these vulnerabilities is exploited can potentially lead to a compromise of the affected system security. Uh, this make IoT system especially vulnerable to this attack uh, because most IoT system are not configured to the update uh, uh, their software automatically. Okay, so usually you install the what we call the drivers or uh, the software inside the device. Uh, so it is not updated um, uh, accordingly. Okay, so it is not do it done automatically. You have to uh, update it um, uh, in order to make it uh, updated. Okay, so uh, let's say there is bugs or anything in, in the devices, uh, it cannot be. It, it can easily be um, uh, attacked through this D DOS. Okay. Uh, some po uh, a wide population of user also not uh, aware of this risk and action, uh, so that they need to to know how to protect their system accordingly. In this video, you will learn about the denial of service attack, otherwise known as DOS or DDoS, when the attack is distributed. DOS is a very powerful attack in which the hacker makes the system or data unavailable to someone who needs it. This is how DDoS may look. One hacker could take control of many computers and make a system or data unavailable to someone who needs it. There are many different ways you can do a denial of service attack. I will list four. The first way is browser redirection. The second way is closing connections. The third way is destruction of data. And the fourth way is resource exhaustion. Here is an example of browser redirection. A user requests a page to load, let's say Disney.com. When the user requests to load a page, the hacker will redirect the user to another page, thereby creating a denial of service. The second way someone could do a denial of service attack is closing connections. For example, a hacker could close an open port and deny the user's access to the database. A hacker can also delete files leading to a resource not found error when someone requests that file. Or, if the application is vulnerable to injection attacks, then the hacker can drop a database table and cause a denial of service attack. In a resource exhaustion attack, a hacker will repeatedly request access to a particular resource. They can overload the web application and cause it to slow down or crash by repeatedly reloading the page. In this video, you learned about denial of service. And for more videos like this, check out cybershallon.org. We aim to educate, educate equip, equip, and empower. empower. DDoS also, um, this, the, the, what we call the method of uh, attacking is quite the same like DOS. Okay, so, uh, but for this D DDoS, uh, a large population of compromised system will create vast amount of network traffic toward the victim system. Okay, so previously it's only, let's say, one uh, attack, but this one, it is uh, in a large population. So, this traffic is combined with legitimate traffic as well. Okay, so for example, uh, the the one the user is, uh, the correctly uh, user using um what we call uh, requesting the, the data or anything. Uh, but in the same time, the attacker will start to um, uh, send the large population uh, of what we call request of data uh, also towards the system so that it become congested. Uh, okay, so then the overload of the aggregated arriving traffic at the target system overload it resources and render it in, in, incapable to serve it legitimate user because of this uh, um, what we call large population uh, uh, asking the same data together so it, it become overloaded so instead of uh, the what we call the the real user who want the, to get the data will get the data but then uh, because of this traffic they will not be able to get the data okay
Hello everyone. Hello everyone. In this In video, this video we're going to talk about DDoS and what it is. DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service. Of service. And what this and what is, it's basically a cyber attack on a specific server or network with the intended purpose of disrupting that network or server's normal operation. And a DDoS attack does this by flooding the targeted network or server with a constant flood of traffic such as fraudulent requests which overwhelms the system causing a disruption, a disruption or port. denial of service to legitimate traffic. So for example here we have a web server and let's just say that this web server could belong to a company that sells their products over the internet. And over here we have a couple of customers with their computers that are browsing the company's website looking at the company's products or services. Now let's just say that someone just wanted to do an attack on this company's web server. And let's just say that they're going to attack the server for whatever reason. For example, maybe they don't like the company or they don't like the owners of the company or whatever. So what happens is the attacker is going to use their computer and their program to attack this server and flood it with fraudulent data traffic to try and disrupt its service. Now this is not a DDoS attack. This is just called a DOS attack, which stands for denial of service, because a DOS attack is an attack that's just coming from one source. Now normally a network or server is able to handle an attack from a single source, because it's easier to pinpoint. The server can just simply close the connection where the attack is coming from. So that's not really a problem. However, the problem is that what if an attack comes from multiple sources simultaneously? And that is what a DDoS is. A DDoS is an attack from multiple sources all at once. So this computer here, who is the ringleader, can communicate with other computers around the world and coordinate an attack on this server. So now, instead of an attack coming from a single source, the server now has to deal with an attack from multiple sources. And when this happens, it will overwhelm the server. It will eat up the server's system resources, such as the CPU and memory, and it will also eat up network bandwidth. So as a result, these legitimate computers over here are going to be denied service because the server is too preoccupied in dealing with a DDoS attack. So the web pages that these computers want to access are either not going to load or they are going to be very slow in loading. And they'll get that familiar spinning wheel of lag on their screens. So the question is, how does the attacker get other computers to get involved in a DDoS attack? And the simple answer is by using malicious software. The attacker will develop a malware program and distribute it over the internet and put it on things like websites and email attachments. So if a vulnerable computer goes to these infected websites or opens these infected email attachments, the malware will be installed on their computer without the owner even knowing that their computer has been infected. So now their computer has been recruited in an army of other infected computers to perform a DDoS attack. And this army of infected computers is what's called a botnet. Now this botnet is not just limited to a few computers. This botnet could be hundreds or even thousands of computers that are scattered all over the world. So now this botnet can be controlled like an army waiting to receive instructions from the attacker who is now like a centralized command and control center for the botnet. And then the attacker can send out commands to all these computers and to tell them to attack at a certain date and time. And then once that set time is reached, the attack begins. Now a DDoS attack can last for hours or even days. It just depends on the attacker's intent. So another question is, why do people do DDoS attacks? 
DDoS attacks can happen for several different reasons. For example, it could be for financial reasons, and the attacker is DDoSing a competitor in the marketplace. It could also be for maybe political reasons. Maybe they don't like the targeted organization's beliefs. Or it could also be that maybe the attacker is just doing it for fun. Please look into the video of the OS and also uh, DDoS so that you can see what will be the difference between DOS and also DDoS and how does uh, the DOS and DDoS uh, uh, attack happen in uh, the IoT system. So the next uh, type of app, uh, security is uh, generic application security. So generic application security, they have two uh, what we call tasks. Okay, the first one is support, which is the one that provides generic services to the IoT environment. Uh, for example, the system update and upgrade. Uh, and then for the second one is process, which is the one that implement the specific process for the specific IoT system. Okay, so meaning that uh, uh, the first one is, is support by by doing something that uh, the IoT system cannot do. For example, doing the update uh, of the system and upgrade it. Okay, so then the, another one is uh, it 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 become the process itself. Okay, so it it, it has specific tasks for each of the IoT system. So this generic application security is the one that work for that uh, uh, specific IoT system. So generic application security support includes mechanism to defend against attacks, to distributed denial of service, and also secure and upgrading and etc. Okay, so something that is uh, done in order to support the IoT system and also to protect the uh, IoT system. So the next security uh, uh, type that we have to look into is application process security and safety. So application security is the process where uh, the, uh, it is the process of de developing, adding and testing the security features within the application to prevent security vulnerabilities against threats such as uh, unauthorized access and modification. So application processes, for example, the control process in industrial environment, uh, a program that execute the necessary code to calculate uh, the required output and implement the process action in the system. Okay, so when we want to um, uh, develop this application process, the application designer will provide the specification of the application. Okay, so including the safety properties itself. So, uh, when we already said, oh, okay, this is uh, requirement for the safety for this application process. So then the software will be developed according uh, to the specification given by the application designer so that we uh, we can secure the vulnerabilities uh, overall for that application process. So the safety and security problem become a, a verification and monitoring problem. So because you already set the specification uh, for that uh, processes to, uh, to that application processes, so we can monitor it. We can verify whether there is any any modification or any what we call interruption into the uh, to that uh, processes okay so that uh, it become the security to that application process itself okay so that um, uh, this one uh, this program will become um, what we call uh, the safety to ensure that there is nobody that uh, alter the the process uh, and execute as expected based on the specification that already set by the application designer. The next one is reliable and secure by design IoT application. So the concept of secure by design application is the extension to the principle of correct by construction program introduced a long time ago. Okay, so in essence, uh, for this reliable and secure by design IoT application is you start with the security, uh, security risk analysis. You 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 perform this uh, uh, possible uh, list of uh, threat vulnerability vulnerabilities and the, also the probability the, of attack that can happen to your system. 
and then uh, what will be the impact of the uh, attack uh, can be to, to, to your system and then uh, what you can do is decide on a appropriate uh, countermeasures uh, how do how do you solve this uh, kind of uh, threat uh, how do you treat um, this vulner vulnerabilities and then uh, how do you counter counter the attack um, uh, the certain type of the attack okay so meaning that you prepare in advance uh, what will be uh, what we call a uh, possible uh, problem that can happen so the the what we call the the how to countermeasure that one also uh, is um what we call is planned in advance before it happens so then when it happens you can uh, attack and also you can uh, countermeasure it uh, right away the next one is runtime monitoring. So, how does run monitor runtime monitoring work? Uh, it is a, a system where uh, you want to monitor your uh, system via the uh, behavior of your system. Okay, so runtime monitoring system for security can be can be classified based on two parameter. The first one is the method that describe the behavior, uh, which uh, depend on the profile base or model base and the second one is the method that compare the behavior uh, whether it's matching to bad behavior or deviation from the good behavior okay so this lead to the uh, four classes like this one uh, class one class two class three and class four let's see uh, how does this class one to uh, till uh, class four uh, work okay Okay, so when you look into this uh, table, you can see that uh, we have class 1, class 2, class 3, and class 4. This is divided by the one is profile base and one is model base. Okay, so for class 1 and class 3, it is under profile base and uh, class 2 and class 4 under the model base. And then uh, in terms of the behavior, uh, class 1 and class 2 under the bad behavior matching and class 3 and class 4 is good behavior deviation so let's see the uh, uh, how does class 1 class 2 class 3 and class 4 work okay so let's see for the class 1 class 1 it will monitor the system that detect attack uh, by matching with bad behavior typically it use statistical method and also the machine learning method uh, it uh, build the profile of bad behavior and the statistical profile of the attack so meaning that uh, not only from the actual cases it also uh, have the machine learning uh, method where it can um, detect this bad behavior okay so the class 2 uh, is a little bit uh, different from the profile base as profile base is based on the statistic, statistical and machine learning. Uh, for class 2, use a model of the behavior of the monitored system. Uh, class 2 is quite limited because they can detect only known attack, meaning the attack that, uh, that already happened uh, somewhere uh, 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 in the, what we call, in the industry or in the system uh, previously okay so meaning that it's based on the real uh, kind of attack that already known okay so this originates from their bad behavior model which are already known by definition uh, or the, at the attack is already exist okay so for the class 3 which detect deviation from good behavior so usually the system is good and then suddenly it deviate from its good behavior okay so meaning that uh, there is something wrong with the with with that uh, uh system okay so usually build a statistical profile of good behavior and detect deviation from that so this one also based on the profile base and also machine learning so they already have their databases of the what we call the good behavior so suddenly the system is not uh, uh, acting the way it's supposed to be so it deviate from this good behavior so we can detect that there's something wrong with the system okay so then for the class 4 is monitoring detect deviation from a good behavior model based on the actual condition okay so meaning that oh okay this is supposed to uh, come out with this kind of uh, output suddenly the output is not not supposed to be um, that it's supposed to be okay so then uh, you can detect there is a problem with the system
the last security that we're going to look into is the RMAT approach. Okay, so RMAT approach is a promising approach that address safety and security in uh, a unified way in IoT system and cyber physical system. Okay, so uh, this RMAT uh, system is based on three basic concepts. The first, we can build secure by design system. We can monitor the system at runtime for correct operation to detect attack or failures. And when there is a failure or an attack, we can have plan, we can have plan to recover depending on the problem and how much information we have about it. If, if we look into this one, you can say that it is a combination of several um, of type of security that we already learned previously in this uh, uh, in this lecture. Okay, so RMAT has been developed focusing on industrial control system, but it is applicable to other IoT system as well, since the software complexity is comparable to that of industrial control system. So under the structure of RMAT middleware system, uh, it composed of several components. The first one is the runtime security mon monitor. Uh, the like the one that we already uh, uh learned uh, previously okay and then they have the diagnosis model module and then the recovery module the trust model the adaptive uh, method selection model and also the backup module so let's see the how the the uh, the armed approach work okay so uh you can compare this to the uh, picture in the previous uh, slide okay so uh, the runtime security monitoring uh, will take uh, charge in this RMAT approach where um, it monitor and observe the behavior of the application execution uh, and also it predict the state of the application execution by executing its specification. Okay, so the specification execution define the expected good behavior of the application and optionally known bad behavior of the application that includes known attack. Okay, so this is uh, like we, we look into the um, runtime uh, monitoring previously. Okay, so it applies this runtime uh, monitoring in the system. Uh, where it detect uh, the bad behavior or deviation from the good behavior. So when they compare and uh, do the prediction with the ob observation, so you can monitor and uh, detect the deviation that indicate a failure of the application or, or any attack to the system. Uh, when we detect the uh, uh, the what we call the application uh, the the failure of the uh, application or the attack uh, armat will proceed to the stage of diagnosis uh, in order to identify the failure or attack based on the trust model that is included okay because they already have the trust model uh, uh, in the system so they can compare and then diagnose whether or oh, this is a, a threat or it is not okay so if it is there is a failure or uh, it is not okay so after the diagnosis phase uh, is concluded all available information is used by the recovery module okay based on the diagnosis information the recovery module choose an appropriate uh, adaptive method for recovery and enable the system to recover so taking into consideration previous state as taught uh, by the backup module okay so meaning that uh, when they detect there is a problem or anything, so they they will uh, um what we call uh, go into the recovery module. Okay, so uh, it will uh, recover the modules so that it can uh, work um uh, again as usual. Okay, so this is done uh, because they already have the backup module. They backup uh, uh the what we call the system is supposed uh, to work. Uh, how how does it supposed to work? It recover it again so that the system can uh, work uh, as usual, although it, it has been attacked. Okay. Next, let us look into the security testing in IoT system. So as we already set the security to our IoT system, of course, this system need to be evaluated for conformance uh, to specification and requirement. Uh, including the security and IoT system. Okay, so verification and valid validation technique uh, is one of the options to ensure that the system is built according to the specification and requirement. 
but they are very limited uh, for two main reasons. One, um, because we know that uh, in the industry, it cannot be one solution for all. Okay, So the complexity of this process is growing exponentially uh, because each industry will have their own system and uh, each of the factory or each of the system will have their own setup. Uh, which is very complex, okay, uh, depending on their, their process or depending on their uh, production, okay. So, uh, due to this uh, complexity, it's become uh, more difficult to check on the security, okay. The second one is the current business model that include long supply chains with different provider and developer of system component do not enable a unified description of design and implementation that can be checked as a whole because it involves a lot of stakeholders and it uh, involves a lot of what we call uh, different type of um, technology that combine together. Uh, so, uh, and not only that, uh, if let's say one factory is uh, operating, there are a lot of other things uh, uh, that will be involved uh, along the way. So it become a long supply chain, okay? So that's why it's become uh, more difficult in order to test all the security. Among all of the type of uh, testing for the security, fast testing security is uh, one of the process that being uh, what we call um, uh, suggested because uh, fast testing uh, provide alternative uh, which reliable approach uh, with successful result and advantage over the previous methods okay so fuzzing is a testing method that apply test input meaning uh, we put uh, the test on the system that we already set uh, to the system under test which is what is the system that we we already set okay uh, and then uh, we observe its output, okay, so that we can detect uh, what will be uh, whether the the system is working um, uh, uh, in a good uh, way or not. If it is not uh, the the output that we are supposed to get, then uh, this system will detect uh, the the what we call the output, okay. So the goal of the fuzzer is to identify uh, identify fault in the SUT. Okay, so for example, to detect input and lead to a system crash. Okay, so meaning that we detect it first before it happens when it is operated. Okay, so the effectiveness of the fuzzer is based on its ability to identify as many vulner vulner vulnerabilities as possible, covering effectively uh, the input value space. So in programming and software development, fuzzing or fast testing is uh, considered as automated software testing technique where it involves providing invalid, unexpected or random data as input to a computer program. Okay, so this program is then will monitor an exception such as scratches, failing built in code accession or potential memory leaks. Okay, so typically the fuzzer are used to test program that takes structured input and then the structure is specified, for example, in a file format or protocol. Uh, and distinguish valid from invalid input, okay? Here are some advantages and disadvantages of uh, fuzzing uh, testing method, okay? So, uh, for the advantages, uh, it can be applied to program whose source code is not available. For example, you, you don't have any access to the software uh, coding and everything, so we still can... Uh, test the system uh, even uh, without this uh, source code okay so the second one it is independent of the internal complexity of the tested software which limit in practice other methods okay the third one is because of this independent the same fuzzing tool can be used to test similar program independently of the programming language used for their coding okay so meaning that uh, we can apply in a lot of uh, what we call a system, okay, uh, regardless of their uh, program uh, or programming language, okay. The third one is the, uh, the identified fault and error can be directly associated to the user input and can be evaluated easier. So, meaning that we know uh, what are the things that we are testing. We put the input uh, based on what we want 
uh, to know what is the outcome. So meaning that uh, it, it is easier for us to detect what is the type of fault that happened in the system. Okay, so for the disadvantages, uh, the space of input values is vast, meaning that it is uh, there are a lot of input that we can put in there. And thus, it is impossible to test large system for all their potential input values within reasonable time frame. So meaning that uh, because the input uh, that we can put into the testing is very large, so uh, it is impossible to test everything inside there. Okay, so meaning that Mm, uh, it, it will require a lot of time if we want to to uh, test everything. Okay, so the second one is a fuzzer that produces random input values can discover fault and vulnerabilities, but in general, it will not detect easily many important vulnerabilities under unless it follows some specific strategic approach, which means that mm, uh, it is very abstract. Okay, so. Uh, we put random input of, of what are the things that we want to test. Okay, so sometimes uh, if that kind of vulnerable, vulnerabilities is a new one uh, where we have not experienced it uh, in the system before, they might not be able to, to, to detect that vulnerabilities. Okay, so uh, it, it based on what it, the, the system already experienced and then we can test it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the last one is its effectiveness depend on its ability to identify representative input values, which may originate from attack or common error with invalid input and detect vulnerabilities that are useful to attacker. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so if let's say the effectiveness is um, uh, what we call it depend on the ability to identify uh, the input values. Okay, so if the system, uh. Um, does not have the information of that uh, original uh, what we call attack uh, uh, attack on the system they, they will not be able to uh, detect the attack okay now for first testing uh, for the security uh, it can be classified in three categories depending on the information that is available for the system and the test. Okay, so there are three which are white box fuzzing testing, black box fuzzing testing, and also gray gray box fuzzing testing. Okay, so for the white uh, box fuzzing testing, the source code of the specification of the SUT is known. For black, uh, the internal structure of the use uh, the SUT is unknown. And for the gray box fuzzing testing, uh, it is a combination of the white box and also black box. You might know some of the, the information uh, about the what we call the system, and uh, you might also uh, not knowing everything. Okay, so uh, it is in between. So let's see what is white box fuzzing. So white box fuzzing testing will. Uh, tool is ex uh, exploit the information about the system internal structure by using symbolic execution techniques or thin analysis to identify vulnerabilities. So what happened is uh, symbolic ex execution uh, will replace the symbolic values in the source code. Okay, so uh, so that um, uh, it will detect uh, 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 what we call the the execution path of the program. Uh, and then it will identify the vulnerabilities that lead to the control of the flow hijacking. Okay, such tool have been used uh, in the window and line up uh, successfully. This technique have the advantage that they, uh, since you know the source code, you can explore all possible mode of application and you can also identify the dead code. However, uh, the disadvantage will be you cannot identify log logic error in the program uh, and unable to explore all execution paths in last, large program with complex structure. So let's see what is thin analysis. Okay, so thin checking is a feature in some computer programming language, uh, for example, Perl, Ruby, or Ballerina, uh, which designed to increase security, uh, where it prevents the malicious user from executing command on a host computer. Okay, so uh, tools that use thin analysis will identify potential attack. And then uh, by tracing tainted values, and then it will fast the input values to this attack point so that we can detect uh, the source of the problem. Okay. For the black box fuzzing, 
uh, you don't have any structural information about the system and the test. So since the test require application of input to the system and observation of its output, one of the most popular target for the black box fuzzing will be the implementation of communication protocol because this will provide the first point uh, of entry to the system and they typically implement some standard. So there are two main approach to generate a uh, fast testing input to protocol. The first one is data generation and second one is data mutation. Now let us compare this black box, gray box and also white box. Okay, so let's see. Uh, for the black box, uh, also known as uh, closed box penetrating uh, testing, for the gray box, it is a combination of black box and white box testing. And white box is considered as open box penetration testing. Okay, so for the goal, in terms of the goal, uh, the black box will mimic a true cyber attack because you don't have the source code for that um, what system. Okay, so then it is like a true cyber attack. Uh, as for the gray box, it is access on an organization vulnerability to inside inside the threats. And for the white box, it is it simulate an attack where an attacker gain access to a privileged account. Okay, so uh, it simulate like uh, uh, the attacker know the uh, access code of the system. Okay, so then for the access level for black box, usually it is zero access or internal information. You don't have any information at all. Um, uh, for from that system, uh, for the gray box, it is um some internal access and intern internal information is accessible, and for the white box, uh, white box, uh, you know completely the uh, uh access or uh, you have uh, the open access to the application and also the system. Uh, the pro is uh for the black box, it is more realistic. It is like you are you are the attackers who attack uh, the system, and uh, you can test whether it's performed from the um uh, it, it, it the testing is performed uh, based on the point of view of the attacker. Okay, so uh for the gray box, it is more efficient than black box and safe on time and money because some of the internal access is already known. Uh, so some information is already there. So it, it is a combination between the black box and the, also the white box because much, uh, you you know a little bit, but not everything is known. Okay. So uh, for the white box, it's more comprehensive, uh, less likely to miss a vulnerability and faster. Uh, the test is performed from point of view of attacker also, but then uh, uh, you will not miss any um vulnerabilities because you already know everything inside there so you can test on uh, each of uh what we call a uh, component uh, inside this uh, white box okay so uh for the cons uh it is time consuming and more likely to miss uh, vulnerabilities for the black box uh for the gray box there is no real cons for this type of testing because it depends on the information that you already have um, for that, uh, what we call uh, to to the system, uh, for the white box, the con is because you know a lot, you have a lot of uh, source code, so there'll be more data that required to be released to the tester and more expensive. Here are the link to the uh, fuzzing testing um uh, videos. Okay, please look into this video so that you can understand more on the fuzzing testing, uh, in the security. Thank you for listening. Assalamualaikum.